Dr. Prasad is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. He's also the associate editor for a very prestigious journal, the Catheterization and Cardiovascular Intervention. Uh, he has co-authored and authored numerous papers and articles, and he will be discussing with us below the knee intervention. Thank you. Anand? All right, so every year we have a very diverse uh, audience here. So instead of talking just about the how of below the knee interventions, I think it's important we talk about the why. So here are my disclosures. When we talk about the below the knee circulation, we're really talking about the arterial supply that begins at the popliteal artery and extends down to the metatarsal vessels. For many interventionalists, they may treat the popliteal artery but stop there. Others may treat the primary tibial vessels. But what I want to emphasize is that we have to be willing to treat the foot. We have to understand the foot circulation, the physiology in the, in the foot. So that will be an emphasis point of this talk. Well, why do we care about the below the knee circulation? Texas is part of an amputation belt that stretches across the southern United States. And nationwide, the amputation rates have actually gone down. But we shouldn't rest on that, because there is a coming tsunami of CLI, not just in Texas, but in many states. And that's really driven by the rise in diabetes. For the first time in a long time, Texas now is higher than the US in terms of the prevalence of diabetes. Within Texas, my region of South Texas is particularly impacted by diabetes. And that reflects uh, upon higher CLI rates and amputation rates. In fact, some towns in Texas, South Texas, such as McAllen, have three times the higher rate of amputations than the national average. So we're developing a reputation that not only do we shoot first and ask questions later, but we amputate first and ask questions later. And these are just some of my patients who have had amputations. And those of you who take care of these patients know that amputations are not benign. Substantial morbidity, financial costs, and there's the fundamental tenet that amputation sites won't heal if we don't have adequate vascular supply. Now this seems obvious to all of us, but if you look at the Medicare data, you see that the majority of patients with self-reported PAD or a diagnosis of PAD undergo amputation without revascularization or even angiography. And when you look at the mortality and morbidity data, you see that there's significantly increased rates of mortality, wound infection, cardiovascular events in patients who undergo amputations. And not just in the first 30 days, but if you follow them out, there's decreased survival in those patients. And we understand that you can reduce amputation through revascularization, whether you choose surgical or endovascular therapy. And while we're interested in morbidity, we have to look at mortality. The majority of these patients die from cardiovascular causes. In fact, the mortality from critical limb ischemia is higher than that of breast cancer and colorectal cancer combined. And for me, when I saw these data, I was just shocked. I mean, this is something you don't hear a lot about. We have great public awareness of cancer and stroke, but very little emphasis on critical limb ischemia. In addition, there are data, though uh, few, that revascularization can actually decrease mortality in this patient population. So with all of those data in place, how do you decide how to treat these patients? If you want to revascularize them, do you do surgical or endovascular approach? And it's the traditional argument that's been made in the coronary circulation of the limitations of bypass therapy, namely patient comorbidities, and the limitations of endovascular therapy. And really, calcification, chronic total occlusions have been the limiting factor for endovascular therapy. If we look at a meta-analysis of data, we see that uh, surgical bypass has a higher patency rate than angioplasty. But that does not translate into better long-term limb salvage. So as Dr. Shamas uh, alluded to earlier, what is our real goal in, in this area? 
in below the knee circulation in the context of CLI, really our goal is to heal the wound. So you just want that artery to be open long enough so that the patient can heal their wound. We don't really care so much about long-term patency. And in fact, data from the Excel trial would tell us that the majority of wounds will heal within six months. So if you can get good wound care, restore arterial supply, you can heal most of them within six months. So let's start talking a little bit about the how. And there's tips for success. And a lot of this echoes many of the uh, lessons that Dr. Berlakis has taught us about coronary CTOs. We have to understand patient selection. That's very important. So what patients should we be working on? That's an important uh, idea. And really, you want to focus in on the patients who have rest pain and tissue loss. What about claudication for below the knee disease? More controversial, if you look at the most recent consensus guidelines from SCAI, they recommend for patients who have infrapopliteal disease and claudication, but no inflow disease, that conservative therapy with pharmacologic uh, measures and a walking program are really what you want to focus on. And although they include uh, severe claudication in the appropriate care category, I'll give you my personal opinion in that there is currently a lack of data to support routine treatment of below the knee lesions in claudicants uh, at this point. So case planning, that's very important. You don't want to end up with a mess in the cath lab. And really, on these cases, you've got to spend the time and plan out your case. You have to study the angiogram. You have to understand uh, what approach you're going to take, what equipment you'll need. You don't want to be in the middle of the case and then trying to figure out whether a certain wire or catheter will work uh, in a certain sheath. And you want to start by understanding the angiosome concept. And now this is important for everybody, not just interventionalists. Anybody who treats patients with diabetes, you have to understand the angiosome concept. Similar to a dermatome, and we're familiar with dermatomes, there are angiosomes. So in the vast majority of people in the population, there are uh, certain arteries which reliably feed certain areas of the lower extremity. So if you have an ulcer on the top dorsum of your great toe, you have to think about the anterior tibial, the dorsal arch, the dorsalis pedis as the uh, important arterial vessels. Similarly, if you have a plantar wound at the bottom, you have to look at the supply of the posterior tibial and the patency of your plantar circulation. If you can open the artery that goes directly to your wound, you have a much better wound healing rate and freedom from amputation than if you open an artery that provides collaterals. So you, you want to shoot for an angiosome-guided approach in endovascular therapy. How do you decide how to access the patient? That's very important. Now, most people who do peripheral interventions are very comfortable with the contralateral approach. But if you're going to do CLI, you have to really be comfortable with ipsilateral anagrade approach and the retrograde approach through a transpedal conduit. And to do that, you have to become comfortable with ultrasound. Ultrasound is very helpful at uh, targeting the vessel for pedal access, telling you about the health of the vessel. It can actually guide your intervention. And you have to know how you're going to access the vessel. What kind of sheath are you going to use? Are you going to go sheathless? In my practice, uh, you know, these four, four French uh, sheets from Teruma are very helpful. Um, they allow uh, retrograde treatment of many lesions. You also have to figure out what wires you're going to use. While you can use the traditional CTO wires that you would in the coronary circulation, there are much heavier tipped wires that are used in the peripheral circulation, as well as 018 wires that can be used across some of these calcified uh, recalcitrant lesions. Support catheters, a variety of flavors, sizes, angles, etc. Make sure that the catheter you use will fit through the sheath if you're going retrograde. You don't want to be uh, stuck in the middle and realize you can't deliver your catheter. In terms of crossing devices, again, this was alluded to, there's a variety of different crossing technologies that are available now. Uh, our experience in the XLPAD registry and at my institution has been with the Viance catheter, 
uh, which uh, can be used retrograde or anagrade. Uh, as Dr. Banerjee showed us, if you do decide to use a crossing device, your success rate may be higher. And if you're going to do these cases, you're not always going to be true lumen. So you have to be ready to re-enter. Uh, the interior device has been particularly helpful. It's the uh, brother, if you will, of the uh, Stingray device uh, that was demonstrated earlier in the coronary CTO. It's relatively low profile, and it's quite good retrograde or anagrade for uh, re-entry. All of these tools have come at a time when now the traditional limitations of endovascular therapy are no longer in play. And lesions that originally we would send for surgical bypass, we can now uh, attempt with an endovascular first strategy. So in 2015 now, what are the real treatment options for our patients? And primarily, if you look nationwide, it's still dependent on angioplasty below the knee with adjunctive uh, atherectomy to help with calcified lesions. While the role of drug-eluting balloons is still questionable below the knee, there are times when we have to use drug-eluting stents, primarily using off-label use of uh, coronary stents. And the times when we do that are when we develop large dissection planes that we have to tack up with uh, DES. So I'm going to uh, end here with a uh, case example. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just show one. Uh, but this case really summarizes where we've come in 2015 with our understanding of diabetes and below-the-knee disease. So this is a 58-year-old diabetic female. She's got uh, severe neuropathy. And most of you here have uh, seen diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, traditionally, at least when I was in medical school, we were taught that uh, diabetic foot ulcers are a result simply of neuropathy, perhaps Charcot's anomaly, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a different process than an arterial ischemic ulcer. But the term I want you to understand now is neuroischemic, that ulcers that we think are neuropathic actually have an underlying arterial component to them. Uh, about 40 to 50 percent of the time. So just because a patient has a plantar diabetic foot ulcer, we can't ignore them and say, well, this is just diabetes related, nothing I can do. In fact, this is a patient who would have a semi-normal ABI, 1.2, transcutaneous oximetry of the dorsum of the foot in the 40 range, again, normal, yet has not healed this wound and, in fact, has been referred for a uh, amputation in the past. If we looked at her arterial supply, she has really uh, no significant inflow disease. Uh, but when you look at the foot, and that's why it's important to do your angiograms all the way down to the foot. And what I've learned is even for claudicants, when I'm doing a SFA lesion, I do an angio all the way down to the foot in case I embolize or they develop CLI later. But you can see that there is essentially no plantar circulation, uh, a big void where her wound is. But we're able to actually reconstruct her plantar arch. We actually have a, a fairly large series now of these cases that we're putting together uh, where uh, we uh, are able to cross chronically occluded vessels. And what you'll find is you would think that the artery at the bottom of your foot, on the sole of your foot, is quite small, but it's, in fact, quite large. Even diabetic females, uh, two and a half millimeters in diameter. Uh, so we're able to do escalating balloon angioplasty and eventually do angioplasty of the entire uh, plantar loop. And, and you see now we have uh, a whole uh, vessel that was missing before giving branches down to the uh, uh, sole of the foot. And a wound that she had for two years, four months later, is now closed. So we have to, again, think about the foot. We can't ignore what's going on in the uh, pedal circulation. And with that, I'll stop uh, and thank you for your time.